Hi everyone, my name's Jamie. Welcome to AXA Arctic Live. We're broadcasting from a virtual Neolisand and it's really wonderful to have you all with us. Now today's lesson is an Arctic food chain mobile, so we'll be discovering all about life in the Arctic and how it's exited. Now before we start, I'm going to give you a little tour of Neolisand. We're just going to go over the sort of format of the lesson and then we'll get onto some shout outs as well. Now we're up in Neolison normally for Arctic Live. That is on the island of Swalbard. I've got a globe here just to show you whereabouts we are. So I'm just going to lift this up to the camera. Here we are. So if you can see um, the UK here, France, the US over on the other side and we are up here on the small island of Svalbard and that's halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole We've got Greenland here and then Russia over here as well so that's where we are we're in a science community so what used to be an old mining settlement and now that's since the sort of 50s been turned into a series of science research stations now on Arctic Live, what we'd uh, be doing is we are typically looking at a couple of things. So we've got a split between science and education. And so we would be bringing all you wonderful, wonderful people up here to talk about the science, which we're looking at plastics and ocean acidification. And that's how the chemistry of the ocean is changing. And we would have the a science team would be out on the fjord behind me looking at what's happening out there. Then next week they're going to come into the studio and we're going to talk about what they've been finding out. Now we've also got this education side of this week. Um, the first week we're talking about all the different types of life in the Arctic, living here, the, um, how to survive. We've got Nick Cox coming on to talk about surviving in the Arctic. Uh, tomorrow and his amazing career there. But if I um, maybe just show you around Neolison a little bit, um, we've got um, a variety of different buildings. We've got the UK Arctic Research Station. We've got a canteen where we all go for our food. There's science labs. There's all these amazing um, different buildings that keep us safe and going. Now, for the format of this lesson, um, we've got so many questions coming through from you guys, absolutely fascinated by all the creatures we find up here, that we're going to have a three, sort of four sections. First of all, we're going to go over some science vocabulary and look at the living things up here. Then we're going to do a very brief sort of like idea about how to do the activity itself, not spend a lot of time on that. Do complete that at home and, and, and send us um, your finished work through using the hashtag Arctic Live. Then we've got um, lots and lots and lots of, of submitted questions, so we'll get to those. And then last, but by no means least, we'll get onto the live chat over here for questions um, on the live chat. Now, there is, before we get into um, a bit of housekeeping and a bit of um, and your shout outs, most importantly, a competition. I'm not quite sure what the prize is, but what I would like you to have a think about is behind me here is a creature from the Arctic. And I want you to have a guess what it is. And then we'll have a little bit of a reveal at the end of the live lesson to see whether you got it right. So, we're going to get onto some housekeeping. You'll see there's a live chat over here. It is a classroom, it is not a chat room. So wonderful to have your shout outs saying where you're from. Great to have your comments and questions. Try and keep everything else to a minimum. It just helps us to see the questions coming up uh, so we can answer those um, as sort of well as possible. So, we have students, good morning everybody, we have students from UK, USA, Spain, Qatar, New Zealand, Switzerland, Ireland, Ukraine, 
Australia and Germany joining us. And we have some special shout outs. So good morning to everybody. We have Aisha Abdulrahim and Yaya Yaya, um, and they're homeschooling um, with her niece Latif. Good morning. Hello from Tudor Primary School. Good morning to all the students from Tudor Primary School. Hello to everybody from Oakfield Academy. Hi to all the students at Oakfield. Uh, St. John of Jerusalem Primary School in Hackney Year 2. Wow, fantastic to have you with us. Um, hello, everyone. We are excited to be here in the virtual classroom with you all, and that's the gang at St. Dennis Primary in Southampton. Wonderful to have you too. Uh, we've got a big well done to all the students, um, all the Year 6s from Goodmaze Primary School who are tuned in. Great to have you with us. Um, AGSB Jog Sock from Mr. Williams. Big hello to all you guys. Year 6 at Brookbourne Primary. I'm going to have to whiz at some point. Uh, 4W, Holy Trinity, Sunningdale, and that's from Miss Woolbanks. We have Westfield School, Newcastle upon Time from Mrs. Meeson. Hi, everybody. Year 4 children at Dustondale Primary School. Um, Mr. Clark and Miss Copeman both hope you're all enjoying the live lesson. Fab to have you with us. Uh, Miss Kate, uh, Miss um, Serena's um, third grade class from the American School of Bilbao. Great to have you. Uh, we have hi to all the students um, from Rocco Carriera in North Ca Canterbury, New Zealand, who are in week seven of lockdown. Great that all you guys are tuning in um, during lockdown for this live learning. Year five at Greenleaf Primary School. Um, Kite's class at Roxton Primary School. Shout out to year five from the Hall School in Leicester. Maple class at St. Helens Cliff are working so hard this week uh, during our science week. Great to have you doing some Arctic science. All the year fives at Penthorpe and Rudgwick are working remotely from home. And year four from Riverside Primary School on the Wirral, who are currently watching from home whilst our school is shut. And to the children at Thameside Primary uh, School in Caversham who are watching. And we've got so many lovely uh, messages coming through on the live chat as well. Really great to have you with us, um, especially during uh, these testing times, and hope we can give you a little bit of an Arctic escape. Now, as I mentioned before, today's lesson is all about living things in the Arctic and how they are connected. Now, there's some important science vocabulary that we're going to go through, and we're going to talk a little bit about those different living things. And then we can move on to thinking about how we connect them in food chains. So first of all, we have um, three feeding terms. So in, with, with the sort of with the food web, food chains, we need to think about feeding terms. And I'm going to put some definitions up for you. So the first set of definitions is herbivore, omnivore, and carnivore. Now, we've got some examples up there, but basically a herbivore is a creature that feeds only on plants. So herby, herbs, yeah, vor eating. So we've got an example there of a clam. Now, an omnivore is an animal, a creature that eats both plants and other animals. So many humans are omnivores, and, and so that's a good example. So if you eat both um, meat and vegetables, then you are an omnivore. And then we have carnivore, and a carnivore is a creature that feeds only on animals. And we've got the walrus there, and we'll find out and think about what it might be eating. I wonder if you can think of perhaps the most famous carnivore in the Arctic whilst we're going through this we're going uh, so let's get on to some so hopefully you've got the herbivore the omnivore and the carnivore and that's going to be really important as we try and link different animals together now the next thing is well if animals are eating plants and some other animals are eating other animals where does all this energy start from and so we kind of know that the, the sort of bottom of the food chain or where, where it all starts is with plants. And in the Arctic Ocean, like here, um, it's really algae, so tiny plant-like organisms. And they get the energy from the sun. 
So there's got a sun here. And through a process called photosynthesis, and I think we can get the definition up there. And th this is a process by which producers, so those are living things that make their own energy, make it using carbon dioxide and water and sunlight. And it's just the same up here. With the melt, you might even, when well, this bit of snow melts, it's about 100, 150 meters down to the fjord. You might even find some small land-based plants as well here. And that's what the reindeer will be grazing on. So we've got photosynthesis, and that's a process by which these sort of small algae and other plants make their own sugars, make their own energy by combining carbon dioxide, water with the power of sunlight. And then we can think about some of the relationships in a food chain or a food web. Now we group these animals in two different ways. We've had the herbivore, carnivore, and omnivore piece, and we've also had the photosynthesizing living things. So we have producers and consumers. Now, a producer is those last types of living things we've been talking about. Those are the living things that create their own sugars, their own energy. And most of that is by using the power of the sun. There's some really cool stuff in the deep ocean, but that's a whole other lesson. So in our food chains today, the producer is going to be the algae. And those are the small plant-like living things living in the ocean. Now, a consumer, through the word, is, is, is very simply something that consumes something else. And it could be a herbivore, it could be a carnivore, and it could be uh, an omnivore. Now, they're consuming other things. So whether it's consuming um, algae, like small creatures eating the algae, or whether it's a I'm going to give it away. A polar bear. <laughs> you all knew it was a polar bear, didn't you? Uh, as the biggest, uh, one of the biggest predators up here, one of the biggest uh, consumers up here, carnivores um, eating maybe a, a poor little ringed seal out here somewhere. And the last set of definitions that I want to go through is predator and prey. So we have what are called predator prey relationships. And we have a predator, that's an animal that hunts other animals, and a prey, that's an animal that is hunted by another animal. So on the screen now, you can see a polar bear, and a polar bear is a predator of the seals. And then on the other side, you can see the seal there, the, the wee ring seal, that's the prey of polar bears. So that's what we call a predator-prey relationship. <laughs> Now, those are some of our definitions. I'm just going to check on the live chat. I know there's a slight delay on it at the moment, um, but I'll just monitor that to make sure that we can sort of see anything um, coming coming up in, take, in case we need to go over any of those definitions again. Lots. And so I wonder whether you, uh, am I going to give you the game away? No. Move aside to make sure that my, my, my little creature behind me is, is nice and hidden. So what we're going to do, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the activity and how we start to link these living things together. Remove my globe out of the way over here. So hopefully what you will have done is you will have cut out all your cards. I'm going to bring them closer, so don't worry if you can't see them at the moment. All these cards here, I've got a sort of whole selection. Put them the right way around, that'll be nicer, wouldn't it? Um, whole selection here. And we're just going to go through these different um, living things, and then we're going to start thinking about how they are connected. We're not going to make the full mobile today. And that's because I want to answer as many of your questions as possible during our time together. So we're just going to go through the, 
one by one. Now, I'm going to start off with the sun before we get into the living things, just because the sun, as we heard, is powering the whole of the food chain. So we need the sun at the top, and then we're going to come on to the next one. Where are we? We're going to have the algae here. Now, the sun is powering the algae, and through the process of photosynthesis, they are making sugars, which starts to feed other things. So I'm just going to come through here. In no particular order, we're going to come up with um, the Arctic cod. So we'll think about how that's linked. Very cool, the Arctic cod. Um, it has antifreeze in its blood to survive in these very, very cold waters. Um, next up, we have the Arctic fox, the sweet, wonderful, cuddly Arctic fox. Great to have those around too. Um, I'm just going to squiz through to see who we've got next. Um, a beluga whale. Beluga whale um, is a carnivore. It's a toothed whale, a wonderful white color. So it's it's catching um, so animals with with teeth, almost like a, a similar to an orca, rather than having a sort of sieving motion of other big whales. <laughs> Uh, we have a clam, uh, a type of shellfish. They live in the bottom um, of the sea just out here, and they um, filter small particles um, from the water. We have a copepod um, next up. Um, copepods um, eating, ooh, we'll have to, eating some veg in the ocean. But we'll have to have more chats about the copepod, the most abundant animal on the planet. I think there's 1,347 billion billion of them. And so that's uh, 1, 3, 4, 7, and then 18 zeros. That's uh, so a lot, a lot of copepods, a tiny wee. So just to give you, uh, they're sort of like the size of, of, of your sort of pinky fingernail or even smaller, depending on the type of species you get. Aha! We have the polar bear. So the polar bear is what we call an apex predator because it eats everything else. It's at the um, top of the, the food chain. And so we will we'll find out more about how that's connected in a bit. Uh, we have a ringed seal somewhere. Wonderful ringed seal. Look at that. They, they quite often, you quite often see seals, you see that island there, you quite often see seals sort of hanging out there. Um, that's where you watch. Next up are the walrus. The walrus, um, very cool looking creature. Um, we love the walrus with its massive um, tusks. Hold it up for a bit longer. The walrus are in fact round the corner, um, that way. So if you go in a boat all the way down that way, all the way down the, the fjord, um, and then you'll find the walrus colony further down there. So we've gone through all these cars that you should have in front of you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So lots and lots and lots. How big my hands? A bit, there we go, about that big. And now we're going to think about linking them. So pick one at random, pick a card, any card. Uh, I'm going to pick um, a copepod. So a copepod is a small uh, sort of crustacean related to shrimps and lobsters that lives in the ocean, tiny wee. We're going to try and think, okay, it's a, um, what is going to eat a copepod? So what kind of thing might eat a copepod? And then we'd go and find what kind of thing would be copepod. And we'd put it in a feeding relationship with the Arctic cod. And then next we'd try and think about, well, what would be eating an Arctic cod? And we would have a ringed seal. So as we can see here, the energy, in a, and in a food chain, we have arrows. The arrow goes from the copepod, and the energy goes from the copepod to the 
Arctic cod. And the next arrow would go from the Arctic cod to the seal. We start to have that food chain there. Another food chain that we could start to look at might be if we start off with algae. And then that being filtered out of the water by a clam and then a walrus shuffling along the bottom and feeding on the clams. So what we're looking to do here is to connect these different living things and feeding relationships. And if I had another hand, then I could, of course, put the sun at the top here, powering the whole food chain. So what I want you to do at home Make sure you've got all these cut out. You've got the student sheet, which you can download from the website. And we'll get that put in the live chat, just in case you don't have the link for it. And what I want you to do at home, cut these out, arrange them into food chains, then start connecting those with string and sticks as well. Now, all the instructions are on online on the student sheet. Think about colouring them as well. Think about making your own ones, potentially. And what we'd love you to do is to display your finished examples by having a parent or guardian post those on social media, um, preferably Twitter, using the hashtag Arctic Live. I wish we had more time today and we could do spend all the time doing it together. Um, but what I really would love to do now is to start to get into some of the questions uh, that you've been sending through. So without further ado, here we go. This is from um, Greenleaf Primary School. Um, what is it like exploring in the Arctic? and what you need to bring with you? Uh, it's a great question. Exploring in the Arctic is uh, joyful, uh, painful, and wonderful. Um, it's such a beautiful place. Uh, it is simply stunning. It's like no other place um, I've been on the planet, not even like the Antarctic. And it is, the light's amazing, the, the, the sort of air and the, the some days the air freezes and it's like walking through fairy dust. Um, it is, it can be very painful. Um, so sort of with temperatures down to minus 40, uh, minus 50, 60 with wind chill, it, it really does start to hurt <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, hurt your whole body. Um, but it, but it's definitely worth it. Um, it's um, simply stunning. What and you need? What do you need to bring with you? Everything. You you can't get anything when you're walking. You can't just pop pop to the shop and pick up something if you forget it. So you need to bring everything with you. You cannot rely on the local environment. I suppose the only thing that you can rely on for the local environment from the local environment is snow to melt for water but you do need to bring everything with you. Um, we've got now from Riverside Primary School, Keegan would like to know how are animals and plants dependent on one another? So um, Keegan, it's a great question. So there is a feeding relationship that we've been looking at about how different animals and plants rely on each other. So without those feeding relationships, then you wouldn't have any animals basically because they need to eat plants and other animals to survive. So that, those relationships, super, super important. There are other types of relationships that we can get onto, um, perhaps really on the coral reef where there's some really good examples of what is called symbiosis. Um, other relationships between two animals like that between the anemone and uh, the clownfish between Nemo. So you'll have to tune in for coral live this autumn. Um, Summer would like to know how do living things adapt to the environment? Some of that, that that's a great, great question. So I'm, I'm wondering whether you're talking about 
um, examples of adaptations or how adaptation and evolution works. But some of the examples of adaptation that we would find up here, um, we've talked about the Arctic cod having sort of antifreeze in its blood to stop the blood freezing. We can look at the walrus with that thick layer of blubber to keep it nice and insulated. And there's a really fun activity that we have online called blubber gloves, where you can see whether that thick layer of blubber really does help you to stay warm in the icy waters up here. Uh, you also have animals with thick fur, like the polar bear. So the polar bear, in fact, has sort of like hollow, like tube-like hair to trap as much uh, air next to the to the to the body as possible, and that fur really keeping it warm, and also black skin to absorb any heat coming from the sun as much as possible. Um, we have um, Niall would like to know how many predators. Are there in the Arctic food chain? Now, a great question. We've been over some of those predators. We have the walrus. We have orca up here. We have um, the beluga whale. We have the polar bear. We have the seal. All different types of predators up here. Remember the predator-prey relationship, that between, um, if I just get up a couple here. So we have walrus and clam. So the walrus is a predator and the clam is the prey. So that's the predator-prey relationship. And we find lots of those up here. Um, Bogdan would like to know what happens if the polar bears disappear? Bogdan, it's a great question. I, I, I'm not sure whether, you know, how we will see the Arctic ecosystem change if the polar bears disappear. Obviously, the, the animals on which they prey, um, like seals, the populations may, may change with that. But I think it's more sort of indication of how much um, the ecosystem, so um, the Arctic and the habitat, which the polar bears survive on the, um, the sea ice for hunting, how much that has changed. So if all the polar bears were to disappear, it would mean that the Arctic had changed a lot and that that means that many other animals who rely on the Arctic being a certain way um, would perhaps also suffer. Now, the Arctic is changing in so far as sea ice is decreasing because of climate change and that is reducing the amount of hunting platform for polar bears. They like to hunt seals on the sea ice and so if that decreases they're going to find life harder and other animals will find life harder as the arctic changes um, this is an amazing question this is from antonio um, i know the arctic is in the north pole and antarctic is in the south pole is there a big difference in the food chains because the arctic is surrounded by the frozen ocean and Antarctic is surrounded by open oceans. Um, absolutely amazing question. So, Antonio, you're absolutely right. So, we've got um, the Arctic uh, up at the top here, which, as you can see, is um, ocean surrounded by land. And if I turn us over, um, we have the Antarctic. So, we have um, a continent surrounded by the Southern Ocean here. Now, in terms of food chains, you do have some what we call terrestrial uh, land-based food chains up here. So you've got animals like the Arctic hare, the musk ox, um, reindeer, um, polar bears, all those kind of things that make up a few of these um, land-based food chains. So you don't find that so, so much um, in Antarctica although you might have some bird life down there um, that, you know, that replicates it a little bit um, with skewers feeding on, on penguin, <laughs> penguin babies. Um, so, uh, but the, the main difference will be the different types of animals that you'd have. So um, you have in the Antarctic, you've got the penguins, you've got the leopard seal, um, you've got um, the elephant seals, and in the north, in the Arctic, instead, you've got beluga, 
Um, you've got polar bears and you've got um, what are different things you have in the Arctic? Uh, walrus. Um, <laughs> there we go. So the different animals are there, but the sort of levels of the sort of food chain aren't, aren't too different. I'd say the sort of leopard seal and the polar bear might be sort of fairly similar. Um, walrus and elephant seal might be fairly similar. I'm not quite sure who would be the penguin up in the Arctic in terms of the food chain. But there are similarities, although the, the species are different. And, and as you really well point out, Antonio, both the Arctic and the Antarctic are very much sort of marine um, food chains, marine ecosystems, where a lot of the life is in the ocean. Wow. Um, Charlie Sanders would like to know, what have you done to protect animals where you, where you work? Charlie, it's an amazing question. I'm afraid I'm not an animal conservationist. I do try and reduce my own impact on the environment through sort of personal choices. But the, mostly what I try and do is try to help you understand uh, these amazing environments. Uh, we work, do work on other programs with conservationists um, who are doing amazing work um, to... Um, sort of conserve wild places but really a lot of the work that we do in terms of conservation and helping animals is based on science so it's super important that we work with scientists to get a proper understanding of what's happening and then they can share their research and that can help us make decisions to you know really conserve these amazing places like the arctic um how many polar bears have you seen and were you scared? That's from Oscar. Um, how <laughs> many polar bears? None. Um, none up here, none in the Olison. We're sort of the wrong time of year. They're, they're over on the other side, so they're over where there's more sea ice. So if you go over these mountains to the east coast, there's more sea ice there, and that's where they'll be in a crossover um, into the summer. So if you're here in um, over the summer months, sort of July, August, come up, um, and we'll try and spot some polar bears and hopefully they're quite far away from us. Um, Graham, um, what is the coldest temperature you I have faced? Uh, what, minus 48. Um, minus 48 with uh, just like no wind chill and a minus 60 odd um, with wind chill. Very, 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 very cold, hurting cold, uh, like being stabbed in, um, stabbed in the face with a fork if you have any exposed um, skin. So really quite quite horrible so that no 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 it's something you don't want don't want to experience um Rhea, is there anything that you struggle with being out here uh, for example maybe getting all your knowledge back to experts straight away um Rhea, it's a really good um question now the process of doing research and getting that out to the public is quite long so we're doing a three-year monitoring program of the waters here for the chemistry changes and for the amount of plastic. And so that's three years of coming up here, measuring and collecting the samples, three years of being back in the lab, properly analyzing that um, sort of at the sort of same time, and then working it all out and publishing it. So it can take sort of three to four years from starting a project to having that published and going out to the public. But it's really, really important. And as we see with a lot of science, that it's checked properly and we don't push out sort of like half ideas to the public, that we really check and verify and, and do a study properly uh, so that we don't push out these sort of half, half ideas or unchecked ideas to the public. Wow, Abigail, uh, how fast are temperatures changing in the Arctic? Um, that's a great question. Um, and what effect is, it, is this having um, on marine life? So Svalbard, fastest um, warming place on the planet, I think it's about six degrees, between four and six degrees warmer. Um, in the Arctic Ocean, um, a couple of years ago, or last year, in fact, there was a study showing that some areas had a warming of up to seven degrees Celsius. Massive impact um, on, on sea life. So the warming, uh, first of all, um, warmer seas mean that sort of species from the south will move up north and move up north and move up north. And if we look at our Arctic Ocean again, if those species are coming up and pushing 
other species further north, eventually there's nowhere to go. So you can push, 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 and have a sort of like conflict between different species because they can come further north because it's warmer. But with the Arctic, eventually you get to the North Pole and there's no, nowhere to go. The other big impact is on sea ice. And so you'll find that um, reduction in sea ice affects species that rely on that for food. That's not just the polar bear, but there's a lot of cool, funky species on the bottom of the ocean who rely on falling food from the bottom of the sea ice, from the algae communities that live there, uh, like starfish and urchins. So sea ice and warming, sea ice reduction and a warming Arctic, really, really ungood for life up here. And we've got more on that next week. I think it's on Tuesday with the science of a changing Arctic. So do tune in for that as well. Um, so I'm going to have to do a whiz because we've only got 10. I'm trying to get my questions up on who it's here. Here we go. We're going to have to go for a whiz. Um, Oliver, why was Swalba picked out specifically to carry research on? Swalba's awesome. You can get here in a couple of days from the UK. We've got all the facilities here and it's really easy access Arctic. So we don't have to travel for days and days and days. We've got the logistics set up to get here. Um, Ruben and Oliver, what is the most unusual animal that you have seen in the Arctic? And are any of them in danger of becoming extinct? I love the little orc, um, A-U-K. It's really groovy, groovy little bird. Um, and so I'm not quite sure how endangered it is, but the little orc um, is one of my favorite, as well as the um, ptarmigan, which is a type um, of um, sort of grouse type bird. Um, and I love it. I was up here with some uh, Austrian researchers, and they call it a, uh, if I can do my German, best German of a ptarmigan, a Schneehund, which means snow chicken. Um, so they're pretty awesome too. Um, do you have evidence about plastics in the Arctic? And if so, what impact would they have? Um, that's great. And that's a great, great question. We do have evident, evidence of, of microplastics um, in the fjord here. The impact they could have is that the tiny particles could be eaten by tiny creatures like the copepod. Um, and in terms of increasing or decreasing, we've got Dr. Kerry Lewis, an expert in Arctic plastics and marine plastics, and she is on next week, I think on Thursday. Thursday, Thursday next week. So do tune in, um, Grayson, to hear from her. Caleb, is there anyone in the Arctic right now? Yes, there are stacks of people in the Arctic right now, but most of them are on lockdown. Um, so there are people um, up at the ne Neolosund at the station here, but it's all on lockdown, nobody in, nobody out. If you did want to go to Neolosund for any reason, you fly to Oslo, the capital of Norway, 14 days of isolation. Then from Oslo to Longyearbyen, the main city on Svalbard. And again, you'd have 14 days of isolation there. So if you had to get to the Arctic where we're based, it would take you about a month with all the isolation stops. Um, so you'd be June by the time you got here if you set off today. Um, how do you set up cameras if there are polar bears about um, with a flare gun in your pocket, just in case, um, very, very carefully? Um, I'd, love, I'd love to get someone like Dougie Allen um, one of the greatest um, filmmakers um, in terms of the polar regions. And perhaps we can ask Nick Cox tomorrow, who's worked with Dougie on various trips. There are lots of don'ts um, of how to set up cameras um, for polar bears. And I know that Nick's got some stories of people who have done just that. Um, which <laughs> Arctic creature, this is an awesome question. Which Arctic creature would you least like to be eaten by? Least like to be eaten by. I mean, I, wow. Um, well, I'd least like to be eaten by, I think, a copepod. It just take a long time. I mean, they're tiny. They're sort of this big. And so if you're eaten by a copepod, it would just be sort of, I mean, some of them, okay, I did say that copepods are herbivores, but there are some species that are carnivores. So imagine being gently nibbled for, for years by a carnivorous copepod. I mean, that, that, that would be the least, least like to, to happen. Uh, smallest living thing in the Arctic, uh, and that's from St. Dennis Primer in Southampton. We've got tiny bacteria. We did a great study on those a few years ago, but the tiniest one will sort of animal, critical crawlies, wee beasties, 
are going to be the the types of um, zooplankton. We've got the pteropods. Um, we've got the, all the pods, copepods, pteropods, amphipods, all that kind of thing um, here. Um, when you're living at the research station, what food do you miss eating the most? The food is awesome here. It is amazingly catered um, in the canteen. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's tough going back home. Um, one of the things that they do is they centralize all the food for all the different um, stations, so about sort of 80 to 100 people up here. And to keep happy in the Arctic means you're well fed. So the food is, is super awesome. What do I miss? Nothing really. It's this. Uh, uh, some sometimes they run out of fresh uh, fruit and veg, and so the, then you miss some things that crunch. Um, so like apples, you have to ration to an apple every sort of, every so often. Um, impact of coronavirus on climate change. Um, that's from Nile. It's an awesome question, Nile. We don't quite know yet. Um, so what we're seeing, it's reducing emissions, reducing our impact on the environment. Hopefully, we can carry some of those habits through to a post-lockdown world. But its overall impact on climate change, we have yet to see. Um, highest temperature ever recorded in the Arctic, I, I'm not quite sure, Noah. But it does get quite, I think it's getting up to 15 degrees during the summer here, which is just simply mind-boggling. Uh, uh, Bavia would like to know, does UV light um, rays affect ice melting? Not that I know, but it is potentially affecting some of the, the creatures up here with that the UV radiation coming through and with there being a reduction in the ozone layer, and that's the layer in the atmosphere that protects us from UV radiation. Um, but higher temperatures definitely um, affecting sea ice melt. Okay, we've got four... Four minutes, here we go. Is the Arctic land or water? That's from Grace. It's both, but it's the land around the Arctic Ocean. Most interesting recipe you may have come up with using local resources. Oscar, don't eat stuff up here. It's in the Arctic. Bring all your food with you. Um, and if you really want to make some crazy Arctic food, try our pemmican recipe online. Um, and then we have how do animals find food on the ice? by creeping up on it very slowly as a polar bear, find out polar bear crawl, crawls and doing that to find seal. Do polar bears attack people? Um, yes, they do, but only um, when there's a sort of close conflict. What the polar bears eat, not science researchers, not Arctic researchers, but seals are a favorite and a few eggs maybe in the uh, for breakfast in the summer months. And yes, there are polar bears in the Arctic. And we have... Uh, most endangered animal in the Arctic, um, endangered animals um, include the polar bear, um, the blue whale, uh, the narwhal. I can't offhand remember exact populations um, of some of those animals. I've always wanted to see a narwhal, so that's going to be my, my favorite um, endangered animal up here. Um, do animals eat polar bears? You are not allowed to eat polar bears. Don't even think about it. Um, in extremis, um, no, just don't think about it. And how many types of plants um, grow in the Arctic? That's an awesome question. I'm not sure how many species of plant here, but we have, um, there are flowers around and about um, behind. Um, the important thing to remember, one of the uh, definitions of the Arctic is that it is above the tree line. So no trees here, although you do get lots of small um, scrubby plants and beautiful flowers um, come the summer. <sighs> Wow, wow, wow. Andy, this is your question there. Um, how long do the polar bears live for? About 20 years, sometimes up to 30, but 20, 20 years um, being the average. Uh, so uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. So just your last chance to guess what the secret animal is. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Do we have a look? It's an Arctic fox. It's this little Arctic fox that comes and says hello to us um, at breakfast time. And so there's a little Arctic fox who's our favorite, hangs around the kitchen door and just saying hello. So super, super awesome Arctic fox there. Um, thank you so much. There's so many questions um, coming through. It's absolutely amazing to have them. Sorry we couldn't get through to all of them.
Um, but it's just a you know shout out to Hall School. Um, we've got another of these um, sessions. Um, we've got Arctic Q and A coming up um, in just a bit. So do get some more questions on that if you haven't had your question answered today. Um, do um, also check the other lessons that we have come up over the next two weeks. There are so many awesome people coming on. We've got Nick Cox tomorrow. We've got the fabulous scientists coming on on next week. And it's, it should be an amazing, amazing experience for you. But thank you so much for all your questions. Thank you for taking part. I would really love to see your Arctic food chain mobiles online. So do post pictures of that. And sorry, we didn't have time to go over um, that in great, great detail, but all the instructions are online. Until the next time, it's bye-bye from Arctic Live. Bye-bye.